Hi, here we are at WebMD on Facebook Live today, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Hansa Bargov, a medical editor and pediatrician, and today we have Trace, Dr. Tracy Johnson, who's an OBGYN, and uh, we're going to talk about pregnancy and babies today. So um, I'm, we're really glad you're joining us, and I'm going to let Dr. Tracy Johnson just tell us a little bit about herself. Yeah, I'm a, an OBGYN in Snellville, Georgia, in private practice. I am also one of the WebMD medical reviewers, so you may see my name attached to some of the articles. I'm very happy to be here. Well, first of all, happy International Women's Day, and we're going to talk about certain women, certain issues today that are actually very important to some women, and we just wanted to make sure that uh, we said uh, happy Women's Day to everyone out there. So let's jump right into it, Tracy, if that's okay. Yeah, go um, So Jessica is asking, how soon should I start taking prenatal vitamins when trying to conceive? Uh, that's a good question. I recommend, uh, if you can plan this out, uh, two to three months ahead of trying to conceive. That way you have enough iron on board, enough folic acid, um, and just overall better health. With the, but the folic acid is the key thing, I think. And the folic acid actually impacts the neural tube in the developing fetus, right? That's and correct, yeah. It can actually um, help prevent those uh, spinal defects that unfortunately some babies end up with. Right, right. In preconception, you want at least 400 micrograms of folic acid. And, and most prenatal vitamins, if you just get a prenatal vitamin labeled, this could be a generic one, that's what that has in it. And once you conceive, you want to go up to 600, but you can get that also from food sources. So um, now in terms of nutrition, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that you get and I get for breastfeeding moms. Is there any um, major points that you'd like people to know about what they should be eating when they're pregnant, Tracy? Right, right. I get a lot of questions about fish and I think there's been a lot of talk about that. Some people feel like they need to steer clear. Um, however, that's not really what's recommended. Um, there are certain, certain types of vitamins like omega-3 fatty acids that are good for you and, and especially when you're pregnant, to have at least two to three servings of fish a week, and that helps neurologically with baby development. Um, however, you don't want to go overboard and, and eat too much mercury that are in fish. So the Environmental Protection Agency has a good um, website, and basically they review, um, they put different types of fish in the good, uh, better, and then not so good categories. Um, the not so good is, is the bigger fish that eat all the other little fish, so the um, shark, swordfish, right. tilefish from certain areas, um, the smaller fish like tilapia, shrimp, salmon, those are okay. And if you're concerned, if it's like a family caught fish, uh, you can do kind of a local search on the website on the EPA and they'll advise you, and if you're not sure, then I usually tell people just limit it to one time a week as far as the locally like self-caught fish. But fish is good for you, a good balanced diet is good for you. There's a, um, another website called choosemyplate.gov, uh, and it, it, you can fill in all your personal information and it kind of helps you choose a good diet. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, sometimes we get worried as, as you know, moms-to-be or moms about the mercury, but the issue is really the balance, and, you know, mm -hmm. and as Tracy talked about, the omega-3s are really important, and certainly, cer certainly there's omega-3s that aren't easy to find in vegetables or in the vegetarian diet, such as EPA and DHA, and so the fish become important because that's a great source, but, mm -hmm. you know, because of the EPA actually talking about which fish are good and which aren't, and looking that up can actually really help you figure out what makes sense for your diet. And I would say as a pediatrician, when you're breastfeeding, it's also very important because the baby's brain is also developing. So you should continue the eight to 12 ounces uh, per week during that period as well to make sure your baby gets the most, because whatever you eat is going through the breast milk and providing great nutrition for your baby. So for breastfeeding moms, that's, that's just as important. I just wanted to go back um, and just uh, finish Jessica's question. She was wondering if the first trimester is too late for prenatals, and I'm assuming it will be. But, I mean, if you haven't started them, you should start them anyways. Is that right, Tracy? Oh, yeah, definitely. Whenever you realize you're pregnant, then go ahead and start them. And, and, and like I said, I, I tell people it doesn't have to be a fancy prenatal vitamin, just something over the counter yeah. should have enough in it, as long as it's labeled prenatal vitamin. I will tell you, there's some... I don't think they've realized how to put iron in gummy vitamins. So the gummy prenatals don't 
contain, yeah. I don't Good think any know. iron and, and a lot less calcium. So look on those labels and ask your doctor what they recommend. And those prenatals also contain omega-3s, correct? It, you usually have to have an additional one okay. associated. So unless they right. say it, they may not. Uh -huh, so okay. just look on the label and okay. see. That's great. Uh, so let's go to the next question. And it's from Solisto. I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. <laughs> uh, can, a, can a pregnant woman do Pilates or yoga? And if so, what's the best time of pregnancy to start a workout routine? Uh, that's good. I, I tell patients, I, if you're doing something prior to pregnancy and your body's used to it, you can continue what you're doing. So if you're you are a runner, doing aerobics, I, I wouldn't start that new when you first get pregnant, mm -hmm. but if you can continue what you're doing. And you, you want to kind of target the lower range of, of your normal target heart rate that you would normally when you're not pregnant. Um, but yeah, you can continue Pilates, yoga, and I find people, especially that are big exercisers, they know how to listen to their body. So I, I tell them that too. So for example, if you're a runner and you get to three or four months along and you realize you're a little more tired or a little crampy, then you need to cut back. You, you really have to kind of have that interaction with your, with your body. If there's ever concern, check with your doctor. Um, there's certain things that go on in pregnancy that your doctor may say you know, she wants you to come back on the exercise. But for the most part, you, you can continue things like yoga and Pilates. And so let me just ask you, because I get this as a question as a pediatrician when, I ha when I'm seeing the baby the, the, um, that's one month old or two months old. Sometimes the mom will ask me, well, now that I've delivered, I can go back to exercising, right? What's well, your answer to that? You, I, I start telling people to start slowly. Um, by six weeks, you can start building up at six weeks, start slowly and build up to back to what you were normally used to. Right. Prior to six weeks, I do like people to take it easy, but you know, pushing the stroller around the park is a good build up during those six weeks. Uh, you want to listen I to your body that. during that time too. Yeah, the stroller is yeah. great. Then you get to bond with baby and exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what better, what better way to do it? Uh, just reminding you that we are on at WebMD on Facebook Live, and we are here for you. We're talking about pregnancy and babies today, and Please post your questions below. We'd love to answer them. Like our page and tag your friends. So if they have questions, they can ask us as well. Uh, so let's move on to the next question here. Christy asks, help, my 16-month-old just started biting. After she does it, she laughs. Uh, I have to put a, put a smile on my face as I'm on that <laughs> because my kids did this too. What can be done to teach her this is wrong? So that's the pediatrician question, so let me just talk about that. First of all, you know, 15, you know, 15 months to 24 months, they are exploring. They want to do different things, and they want to discover the world, but they also love to see what your reaction is to things. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, her starting biting was probably something that she started to explore or just do, but if she is getting a big reaction out of it, probably she will continue to do it. So what you want to do is, this is where you want to, and this is a great rule, I think, from uh, age th three months, when your baby's three months, to when they're 13 years old or even 18 years old. When they do something you don't like, be cool. <laughs> Just have a calm face, talk to them calmly, because you know they, if you react to that, that's going to have a negative consequence. So be very zen-like, be calm, and just say, hey, you know, that's not a good idea, we're not going to do that. Uh, take the toy away from her, or whatever she's biting, or the person, and say, no, that's not okay, and basically remove her from that area. So that is probably the best way to do it, and, and if she does it again, you do it again. Um, Punishing or yelling at her probably won't work. So just be really calm and just you know tell her no and remove her from from the area. And that's probably the best thing you can do for that. But there will be more behavioral interactions, and later on this rule will be really important, right, Tracy? As moms, we oh, see that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> so much of that that is not beating yourself up for you know. <laughs> so um, Gaurav asks, and here's another question for Tracy: Is consuming flax seeds safe during the second trimester? Flax seeds are, are hard because it, it, I tend to shy away from anything there hasn't been a large amount of studies on. Um, and for flax seeds during pregnancy, I don't think so. So I generally tell people, stick to your, you know, your prenatal vitamin, a good balanced diet. Um, the, I also said the same things when people ask me about um, herbal supplements just because there's not been a lot of extensive studies specifically on you know, pregnant patients. Um, 
So I think overall, as long as you're getting your, uh, a good healthy diet, your prenatal vitamins, good exercise, I think you're good. I wouldn't recommend adding anything else. Now, if there's something more specific, I always tell people to bring in the bottle of what you're taking and have your OBGYN go over it with you. They can help you do a search for it, look on the back of the label, and kind of advise you to what they think for your personal uh, pregnancy. And I would second that for kids as well. I've had baby um, parents come in with an herbal remedy for, say, teething, and it turned out there were some medications in that herbal remedy that weren't the best for the baby. In fact, there's been some that have been pulled from the market. So I think it's really important to discuss with your doctor, mm -hmm. um, you know, with er, you know, herbal remedies or anything that has not have, does not have the same regulatory influence of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Unfortunately, um, a lot of herbal medicines and supplements do not ha fit under the FDA regulations as drugs do, so they might not have the, the important safety right, screening right. that other drugs do, and therefore it's a good idea always to talk to your doctor, so that was a great question. Um, so let's move on, and again, we're on Facebook Live, we're at WebMD, and we're here to answer your questions about pregnancy and babies and children, so please go ahead and post your questions below, like our page, we're live, and uh, we're excited to be here. So let's talk to Al, let's talk to Allie's question here. My three-year-old has a cavity, hmm, yep. I've been there too, and I've seen a lot of kids with that. Uh, do I really need to get it filled? Because it's just a baby tooth, I figure it'll just fall out eventually. Well, she's right about the fact that it will fall out eventually if it's a baby tooth. The problem is that we don't know how deep the cavity is. And also, you know, is it, is it just that tooth or other teeth that are affected? Really, a dentist would be the right choice here because a dentist can evaluate how deep the cavity is, whether it goes down to the root, because that could actually affect uh, you know, other um, parts of uh, other teeth or other part teeth, teeth, sorry, or other parts of the mouth. And so I think it's really important to get it filled um, or at least, at the very least, talk to a dentist and ask that question to mm -hmm. a dentist so that they can take a better look at it. Uh, so just talking in general, uh, I'm going to just uh, pivot to another topic here while we're waiting for another to uh, another question. But uh, there's a uh, anchor person who's been in the news a lot about postpartum depression, Chris C. Teigen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I know that a lot, a lot of moms worry about this. In fact, I see it even in my office after they de they delivered and they come in with their infants not looking or feeling so great. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, that um, Chrissy Teigen was in the news recently. Just a couple of days ago, she had an article in a magazine about her um, suffering from postpartum depression. Um, it's, it's a big deal about, it can be as high as about one in nine women um, suffer from postpartum depression. And I think the interesting thing about what she said in the article, um, she talked about how it went undiagnosed for about eight months. Um, not really because any of her doctors, but just because it didn't even occur to her to kind of report her symptoms. And her symptoms were, were pretty typical of postpartum depression, which are um, kind of feeling isolated, not wanting to get out of off the couch. Um, she felt like she was very tearful. She was easily um, either emotionally like sad or either angry. She also started having some a lot of aches and pains that even brought her into the ER. So it wasn't until the baby was about eight months old um, that she was diagnosed with this. And, and I think her she talked about her symptoms and how she was treated. But um, I, I would like to touch on that because it, it is pretty important. There's, there's something called the baby blues that may get confused with postpartum depression. And, and baby blues happens usually in the first month, usually in the first week or two. Um, and it kind of peaks over a two to three day period and then goes away within two or three weeks. And, and that's normal. I mean, everybody has you know, hormonal drops just related to the delivery of the baby. And it's felt that some people's, some women's brains are just more sensitive to these drops. And that may be, that's one theory, that may be what provokes postpartum depression. Um, so I'm glad she kind of came out with this because she's a celebrity, people know her, they can, you know, she's, she's very relatable. Um, and the thing about postpartum appointments is we usually make them about six weeks out of when you have the baby. Um, we wanna make sure everything's healed, we wanna see how you're doing. But if you're feeling sad, if it's affecting your day-to-day -day activities, don't hesitate to call your doctor before then and, and be seen. Um, 
there's different kinds of, of treatments for it. Some people choose to go, there's a, a medicine route that you can take a prescription medications. Um, there's some that are even fine, or are thought to be very little affected in breast milk. Um, there's also uh, talk therapy, usually something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which you can do one-on-one -on -one or as a group, or some people choose to do both. But the main thing about that is important to know that you're not alone, there's help, there's treatment, doctors are aware of this, and to report it to your doctor. So. Yeah, I think, you know, anytime you're worried or you feel like you're off, it's also always a good time to check in with mm -hmm. the doctor because you may not know that you have postpartum depression or it's a baby blues. You may not be able to distinguish that, right? That's true. And, you know, just checking in is always a good thing, uh, you know, because it's hard. I mean, one, one well-kept secret, I think, and, you know, it's not a bad secret, but I think, and I talk about this as a pediatrician, you know, everyone celebrates about you being pregnant and having a baby and everyone's really excited about it, but a lot of people don't tell you about how much work it is and how fatigued you get in the first few months. So I think my mantra always is as a pediatrician and a physician and as a mom that reach out and ask for help. You definitely, know? definitely. No matter what. And you are going to be exhausted during that time. Yeah. And people know that. But yeah. they're, sometimes they're not prepared about this overwhelming feeling of sadness and sometimes it affects how the woman is related to the baby, either a flat indifference or maybe even some anger towards the baby. Yeah. So those kind of things need to be addressed. But but yeah, one thing is, is sharing with your loved ones how you're feeling. Yeah. And, and people will come and, and help you. Um, and, and that may just make it better just to have a little time alone, just to have a little time with your partner. Um, people will definitely come and help you. So just don't, you know, don't forget to reach out. So. Um, we have a question from Victoria. She says, I'm pregnant with my second child and I'm always tired. How can I increase my energy? That is a very <laughs> common question. And, and pregnancy, I, do, I remember going to bed at 5.30 when I was pregnant the first time. I mean, you're just exhausted. And then if you have another child, you can't go to bed at 5.30. Okay. So, um, that, you know, I think one thing, it, it may be seemingly much more tired because she is dealing with that first child, yeah. Victoria. Yeah. So, I, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can relate to you. Um, how to increase your energy. Um, some simple things that is napping when you can. I mean, getting that extra sleep. Um, also, it, it doesn't, it, sometimes it seems a little counterintuitive, but, but increasing your exercise may help too. Um, just even walking, getting out and walking 45 minutes a day, you know, may help give you enough, um, a little boost. Um, make sure you take your prenatal vitamin every day. Make sure you're not, you're eating correctly. Um, all those things would, would help. And then in the end, realize that, you know, you are pregnant, give yourself a little slack. Um, and as we yeah. said, enlist people around you maybe to I think let you have a nap. So help is so important, Victoria. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how old your child your, your child is, but gosh, you know, even without being pregnant, you know, a one year old can tire you out. So yeah, exactly. whether you know whatever age your child is, maybe someone a neighbor could actually take care of your child while you go and nap. Or a sister or a friend can come over just for a few hours and give you that break that you need because it's not easy to be pregnant and have a child. We've all done it. Um, some of us have, some of us haven't actually. But regardless, I think it's really important to know that uh, give yourself a break, like Dr. Johnson said. Yeah. So let's see. Lena from our communities asks a question. There are several options for childbirth classes in our area. Is there a specific type of class that's most useful? Well, Lena, I'll tell you what I tell my patients. It, it, it really depends, in my opinion, it depends on your personality. Um, I would, you know, do the research and see which class kind of description resonates with you. Um, there's your basic, you know, a lot of people have heard of Lamaze that teaches more about breathing issues, um, relating with your partner in the delivery room. It doesn't necessarily rule out any pain medications or epidurals. Some people think that specific class does, but it doesn't. It kind of tells you what to expect. Um, there's other certain childbirth classes that focuses more on natural childbirth um, and prepares you mentally for that. And I think if you want to go for that, being mentally prepared and taking a class and doing your research is a great predictor of if you're, you'll be able to, to, to do that. Um, some people may just like a nice overview. I mean, if you're like me, I like to know what to expect. Um, and what are some things that may come up. 
Um, and to know also that childbirth and labor is, is can be unpredictable. Um, so you also kind of have to be willing to go with the flow a little bit more. But um, if you have the overview class, a lot of the hospitals do that, or your local hospital may do that, just to say, when do I call to come in if I'm in labor? What do I expect when I get to the hospital? Who will come in my room? Where am I going to deliver? Sometimes just having that in your brain may help calm any kind of anxiety you have, and that may be all the you know childbirth classes that you need to do. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Go so ahead. I was going to say, I think educating yourself about everything does definitely help decrease your you know anxiety. Or, but I think that I was going to say that you know as women sometimes we like to plan everything out. And you know this is part of that planning, and you know where you're going to deliver, and checking out mm -hmm. the nursery, and making sure a pediatrician comes and sees your baby, is all about planning. But there's certain things in pregnancy that you can't plan. And you know I just wanted to bring up a topic that Tracy and I were discussing earlier about you know planning when to have your baby exactly. Mm -hmm. You know the day of delivery and whether it matters, whether it's that five week period from 37 weeks to 42 weeks. Or, or not. And, you know, recently the American College of Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology reclassified that. And so, Tracy, tell me, tell me what you think about that and why they reclassified it. Yeah, that, it, it's good. I, I think it started out with um, something called elective inductions, which means um, bringing about labor, having a person come in and starting their labor through being induced. Um, at, just for for but electively, meaning the there's no other medical reason. Like there was no high blood pressure issues. There was nothing wrong with the baby, and a lot of times, um, physicians were doing it when the woman was considered term. And back before they reclassified everything, term was considered any time um, three weeks before the due date. That was 37 weeks. Um, after the it was basically different representatives from different medical groups in the U.S. got together and they reclassified 37 weeks of pregnancy to 39 weeks of pregnancy as considered more, it's called early term. Um, so unless there's a medical reason, it's strongly recommended that you do not be induced um, before a week before your due date. And the reason why is they compared even the rates of um, NICU admissions and respiratory issues of these mm -hmm. babies born at 37 weeks. And it can be as high as about 15 to 20 percent of admissions to the NICU at 37 weeks yep. for respiratory issues, where if you waited two weeks later, it goes down to about 4 percent for respiratory yep. issues. So, so I tell people in my practice, you have to be 39 weeks and zero days, which is a week before your due date. That's a hard and fast rule, unless you have something else going on, unless other medical right. issues. Um, and, and I also recommend that your cervix has to be um, we call it ripe or inducible, um, and, and there's certain certain grades we give a cervix and medically to base it on if you're inducible. But I, I tell people it's roughly you have to be already about three centimeters dilated. Uh, otherwise, you would increase your risk of a C-section. Yeah. Um, and if if you're not, then I like to wait around the due date or even up to a week after. Yeah. So I think the message is really wait as long as you can to get to that mark and not go early and it's so interesting to me Tracy because you know 10 or 20 years ago we weren't that aware of that fact mm -hmm. that you know even delivering a week before two weeks before it could have an influence on the child's health but definitely the babies who are a week or two earlier than that 39 week mark can have more respiratory infections they can be put on antibiotics more they can be admitted to the NICU and can have low sugars and actually interestingly I read the study that was done a few years ago that showed even as far out as the kids being six years of age, there's actually a brain development and cognitive difference between those oh. that were born a couple of weeks earlier versus the ones that were full term, full term. And so I think that uh, you know we're we're trying really hard as doctors to you know push that limit to make sure that they are delivered. Right. They stay cooking as long as they can. <laughs> That's right? right. Right. And believe me, I know the aches and pains of pregnancy are a lot, especially that last month. But if you can just try to hold yeah. out and that would be overall better. So um, let's get back to the questions here. Again, we're on uh, Facebook Live at WebMD and we're here for your questions uh, for pregnancy and babies. So here's a question from Catherine. She says, my two-year-old still wets the bed. We've tried everything including limiting liquids before bed. What can help and at what point is this a medical or psychological problem? Well, let me tell you, first of all, 
most two-year-olds probably do wet the bed. In fact, a lot of two-year-olds are not even daytime trained. So, you know, it, the training, the toilet training actually differs, uh, you know, depending on the development of the child and, you know, whether they're showing readiness, are they pointing to their diaper when they're pooping or hiding in a corner when they're pooping or very interested when you go into the bathroom to see what you're doing. Those are signs of readiness for toilet training. But generally speaking, you can a toilet train in the daytime far easier than in the night. Secondly, there, in fact, nighttime bedwetting, if it, ha if, you know, if it has been from the very start, is considered very normal until about age six or seven. Even then, it's considered normal for some kids. 15% of six to seven year olds still are actually wetting their bed. And so I would say to you that if the two year old's wetting the bed, definitely don't feel like it's a medical or psychological issue, unless she's been dry for a six month period and then suddenly reverted. And then it might be worth talking to your doctor about if there's something else going on, such as, such as a urine infection, or is she not feeling, she's feeling, she feeling stressed out, or is there some other medical issue going on? But if she has, you know, not been toilet trained or at night, that is not abnormal. It's very normal at that age. And what I would do is you can gently talk to her about trying, you know, to be dry. But if she's dry, celebrate it. If she's wet, that's okay. You know, it will go away. She will grow out of it. And two is a very young age, um, you know, for you, for her to her to worry about that or your family to worry about that. So, you know, make sure she's well hydrated, make sure she's got good nutrition, she's getting enough sleep and do all the things you would do for a regular two year old and just wait. She will get she will she will get trained eventually. Uh, let's talk about the next question here. Beatrice says, is it possible to get pregnant at age thirty nine and a regular period with secondary infertility? What do you recommend? So I think there's two questions there. Yeah. So let's do the first question first. Well, first of all, secondary infertility, for people that might not know, means this, I suppose Beatrice has, has been able to be pregnant and have a baby before, um, but is having trouble getting pregnant again. Um, and the answer, the simple answer to your question is, is yes, it is possible to get pregnant at 39, even with a regular period. Um, it, Check with your, your OBGYN, but if you're having a period, let's say, irregular every two to three months, you're still ovulating. You're just ovulating every two to three months, so you do have less chances. Um, if you're 39 and you've started trying, I would go ahead and see my OBGYN. I, people with irregular periods, I bring them on in, especially if they're over 35. Um, if you do have regular periods and you're 39, I, I like to give you about five or six months and then try to come in. And then there's a, you know, a whole host of um, lab work, um, studies, radiologic studies um, that could, could be done kind of depending on your situation. Um, the, your BGYN may also um, get your partner to, to be tested and do a semen analysis at the same time just to do the kind of the complete infertility workup. Great, and uh, you know, with infertility, I did want to ask you a question just on that. It, does stress have an impact on, on infertility at all? I think it does, I think it does. And so um, there's been studies about doing um, you know, acupuncture even, and, and that has a calming effect. Um, massage therapy, um, even like group therapy can take away a little of the stress. Not even, not even like a, a therapist kind of session, but just the, you know, other people that share your same concerns that are also going through infertility issues. That can also have just kind of a, a calming effect. And um, it, yeah, and there's been studies that, that yeah. affect that. So yeah, the, the more you can do to relieve that. that's a pretty common that. issue too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the one thing that people, when they go through something like that, is that they feel like they're alone. But in fact, there's a lot of people going through mm -hmm. that. Uh, so always talk to your doctor and, and see what they can suggest. Um, so Jennifer talks uh, is asking, how long after giving birth are your hormones out of control? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, you know, for a while, I mean, I mean several weeks, I, I generally, by the time, if you're not breastfeeding, by the time you get your first cycle, your hormones are kind of getting back in sync as a general kind of rule of thumb. And, and that can be four to eight weeks after you deliver. If you are breastfeeding, um, you, you have a lower estrogen level and a higher progesterone level, and that may not go into the natural rhythm of, you know, having a period every month. Um, for a long time, <laughs> for maybe as long as you're breastfeeding. Um, it's still, you know, good to breastfeed, and, and I think after a while your body 
it gets used to it. Um, but but it, it can take a while. So if you're feeling kind of stressed or more anxious about that, talk to your doctor, just like we talked about with the um, depression talk. Right, and uh, some great, you know, could, um, we had mentioned some sort resources in terms of getting good information. Another great resource that you know I I love and I love the baby app as well is our pregnancy app. You know we have it on WebMD and mm -hmm. a lot of the questions that are being asked here, like the nutrition, the fish, the exercise, all of those things. That's a really great app to just kind of like click on, find your information, it gives you information, and even follows your development of your baby um, mm -hmm. as you go through your nine months. And then you can go to the baby app, which will tell you lots of information about the developmental milestones, like language and when your baby's going to walk and all those things. So I actually used uh, used it myself, um, and I always recommend it to my friends. So let's talk. Um, so just a reminder to everyone: we we are at WebMD today. With Dr. Tracy Johnson, who's an OBGYN, I'm Hansa Bargava. I'm a pediatrician, and we're here to answer your questions about pregnancy and baby. So make sure you send us your questions, tag the post, uh, share this post, tag your friends who might have questions, and just uh, getting back to questions. Jennifer M asks a question, and she says, "Is it possible to get rid of cysts on your ovaries naturally?" Well, what, one thing I tell patients about ovarian cysts. Are. If you are a regularly menstruating woman, you will form a cyst on your ovary after you, that's where the egg comes from basically. So after you release an egg, there'll be a cyst left over. And generally, if the woman gets pregnant, that cyst puts out a hormone to maintain the pregnancy until the actual placenta can take over. So having a cyst itself doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. And so, yes, naturally, it will go away. Uh, if you don't get pregnant that month, or should go away. Sometimes they don't. And sometimes you may just want to wait it out and have the cyst resolve on its own. So it also depends on how the cyst looks on the ultrasound too. So if you are having problems with cysts and your OBGYN gets an ultrasound, they will talk to you about whether it looks like a cyst, a normal cyst of the menstrual cycle, or it looks like something more. Um, I usually will follow a cyst along, get a recheck of the ultrasound and make sure it's not growing, uh, make sure it's either stable or resolving on its own. Um, taking birth control pills, the kind with estrogen and progesterone in them, um, may prevent future cysts from forming. It doesn't necessarily make the ones you have go away, but um, one of the ways birth control pills work is it stops ovulation, so it would stop that cyst that forms every month. Um, from forming, so you can prevent them in the future if it's a certain type of cyst. Great, so moving on to Amy. Amy is asking a question and she says, I'm scheduled for a second C-section soon. I had a C-section three years ago and wasn't worried. Now that I have a three-year-old, I'm scared of having one. In general, how safe are scheduled C-sections for healthy women? I'm 37. The C-sections are very safe for healthy women. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's very common. I mean, as much as um, 15 to 25 percent of women have C-sections. Um, you're going to have some scar tissue from the first. Sometimes people have very little to where I could barely tell they've had a previous C-section. Sometimes people have a whole lot to where I feel like they've had so many surgeries and they've only had the one C-section. And we really, as an OBGYN, you don't really know which type of patient that patient's going to be until you do their next C-section. But um, C-sections are a very common surgery with OBGYNs and because of that we're very good at them and uh, many many women have them and and, and do fine. Um, you know that there's risk of bleeding, there's risk of uh, infection of the incision or in the abdomen but like I said, most of the time everything goes fine. And I, I talk about your concerns with your OBGYN. Yeah. If you think about these questions, write them down when you're in the office. You know, people bring their phones or bring sheets of paper. And I find just talking it out may allay your fears. So. And also, if there's anything that you were concerned about in the previous C-section that's making you worried, bring mm -hmm. that up to your doctor and uh, you know talk talk to them about that because that would a discussion, as Dr. Johnson said really help alleviate any fears around it. But yeah, C-sections are pretty safe. 
So um, our next question, again, we're on Facebook Live, so please send us your questions. We're here for you. We are excited to be here and answer your questions and get some good information out there about nutrition around pregnancy, nutrition around babies, about anything that you might want to ask about babies or pregnancy. Yeah. Here we are. So please uh, tag your friends who might have questions and post your questions. So Hema asks, the lungs are the last to develop in a fetus. How do you ensure good lung development? As a pediatrician on the other side who catches the baby that Tracy throws to me, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really good question yeah. because respiratory issues can be really important in the first four weeks of life, and I'm really glad you're asking this question. So what do you think, mm -hmm. Tracy? Well, we're, it goes kind of back to that 39-week mark. You know, our pregnancy is considered 40 weeks from your last menstrual period, and at 39 and zero is when we are pretty sure about the lung maturity. Um, you know, that would be the time that if you're going to deliver, like for example, the previous patient that wanted that was doing a repeat C-section, we would only schedule a repeat C-section after 39 weeks because that is when we're sure about lung development. Um, it, it, you also have to have good dating. You have to be sure that your due date, your due date mean if you've been dated by an early ultrasound or you're sure about your last menstrual period and you've had prenatal care since the first trimester, then you're pretty sure that you, the, the due date's correct. If, if a person didn't have prenatal care and started prenatal care at eight months, that due date's a little more iffy. Exactly. So having early prenatal care and a, a good um, early ultrasound or, or good dating at 39 weeks is when we're pretty sure about lung maturity. And, you know, if there is trouble in the pregnancy, there are things we can do about it, uh, such as, you know, give some medications mm -hmm. during the pregnancy to help develop that surfactant that's really essential to keep the lungs open. But at the end of the day, um, you know, making sure you wait as long as you can, keep that baby in there, have good nutrition, rest, relax, you know, do all the things for yourself that you need to do, I think, really makes a difference. And from the other side, you know, respiratory distress can be really, uh, you know, it can be difficult for babies, and that's probably one of the number one reasons they get admitted to uh, right. the NICU. So we definitely want to focus on mm -hmm. lung, good lung development. And, and you mentioned the medications. If we are concerned a patient may deliver early, um, there are some, it's a steroid injection that we give um, a couple of times, 24 hours apart, to try to help that lung maturity. It's not as good as, you know, as trying to continue the pregnancy, which we also give medicines to try to do, but, you know, it's something that, that may help the lung maturity speed up. So let's go to Roshan. Roshan is asking how many years gap should there be after the first pregnancy to make the body ready for a second, the second baby? And before we answer today, we were actually yeah. talking about this because there was a big study out of the Cincinnati Children's mm -hmm. Hospital and they actually looked at risk factors. Over 25,000 women were looked at, I believe, and you know, basically to prevent preterm babies, i.e. early babies, which we don't want. We all agree on that. So and one of the things they talked about was a gap between the first and second baby in mm -hmm. terms of the number of years as well as the weight gain that you have during your pregnancy and also what weight you know you are when you start having a pregnancy. But let's talk about this, the gap. What do you think? I, I think a, a general rule of thumb is a year. I think that's a good time to let your body heal, um, whether or not you've had a vaginal delivery or a C-section. And then after a year, get on your prenatal vitamins, you know, at least two to three months ahead of time and, and start trying again. I think that's a, a good um, spacing. You always have to take care of yourself in order to take care of the baby, right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> take that's care true. of number one, and then you can take care of number two, right? <laughs> that's right. Um, so we have Tia from Communities, and this is a kid question. My son is 14 months old, and I believe he's showing some signs of autism. He has no interest in other children, doesn't respond to his name, and he hasn't said any words besides mama. Is there a screening test for autism? So the short answer is yes, there's a screening test, but let me just talk about autism for a second. Um, you know, people are concerned about autism, and I, you know, generally speaking, these, are, these could be some of the signs of autism. It doesn't mean he has autism. So they don't show interest in other children. They may not look over to where you're pointing. They may not engage in pretend play. They may not want to do eye contact. However, there are other things that could also make a child act like this. So the most, important th the most important thing to do right now is to talk to your doctor, and there is a screening questionnaire that can be administered as early as 15 to 16 months. It's called the MCHAT, and basically asks all of these questions, such as, you know, is he interested in playing? Is he pointing to objects? All of those things. Now, the language development I'll just address again. 
you know, that, you know, most 14 month olds can say about mm, one to 10 words, sometimes 20, it just depends on the baby. And remember when, you know, babies are developing, they're all different. They develop at different times. So one baby might start walking at 10 months and the other one doesn't walk till 16 months. And believe it or not, they're both normal. So I think that it's really important to talk to your doctor about this specifically. And lastly, what I'm gonna say about autism is it's really important if your child has autism or even just a language delay or even you know some deafness, really important to get help. So early intervention is my mantra and I've seen it with so many kids where the kids who get early help with language can, it can make such an impact on their lives later on. And Tracy and I were talking about this as well about for example, you know, unfortunately in Georgia right now, 65% of our third graders are not reading in grade level. And we talked about that, and mm -hmm. that's really shocking because these kids are more likely to not read good at fourth grade and then not go to college, not get a job, and, um, you know, or not get a job and, not, and even be, end up on public assistance, unfortunately. So the bottom line is whatever you can fix early makes a huge difference. And, and so I always say read, read, read to your kids, talk to your kids, and if you see any gaps, go to your doctor, and maybe that per maybe the child needs speech therapy, maybe they don't, but regardless, the doctor can advise you on what, can, what you can do to make sure your child gets to their maximum potential. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about uh, another question here, and before I go on, please, you know, we're on Facebook Live, we're here for you, and we have Tracy Johnson, who's an OBGYN, I'm a pediatrician, we'd love to answer your questions, so, you know, go ahead and post your questions. So I'm sorry again about the name, I'm just going to pronounce it as I see it, Hoa, um, says, we've been trying to get pregnant for almost a year now, but haven't been successful, please advise what steps we should take next. I would uh, set up, recommend you setting up a consultation appointment um, with your OBGYN. And what to expect at that appointment um, is he or she will go over your medical history. They'll ask you, um, have you had any treatments, everything. Have you had any treatments in the past for cancer, even? Um, how are your periods? Uh, are they regular? Um, do you notice any kind of ovulatory discharge mid-cycle? Um, ask about your partner's history. Has he ever fathered any previous kids? Um, they will talk about, set you up for some laboratory values. There's some, um, your cycle, the first day of your cycle is considered day one of your cycle. So the first day of bleeding is day one. Um, we will generally bring the patient in for day three labs and day 21 labs. And those labs in general look at various hormones. Um, check your thyroid level, check your prolactin level, which is a hormone that could affect you getting pregnant. Um, some of those um, laboratory values will let us know if you are ovulating. Um, they will let us know how, what we think your ovarian reserve is, um, like how well your ovaries ovulate, how much eggs they have left. Um, we will also check to see if your tubes are open. You know, in order to get pregnant, the egg has to travel down the tube meet the sperm in the tube, then that has to travel down into the uterine cavity. So um, there'll be studies to check and make sure your tubes are open, that your uterine cavity looks okay, and then um, send your husband to get tested as well um, to do a semen analysis. Um, so that's kind of it, the basic in a nutshell. Uh, if any of those values are abnormal, then I would refer the patient on to a more extensive like reproductive endocrinology group and those groups do uh, such things like in vitro fertilization. Uh, so that's your initial visit um, to set up and they'll kind of, uh, your IBGYN should go over all those values with you and, and why they would be doing those tests. And it's always good to uh, find out what could be affecting it and I think in most cases you can't find an answer, right? Um, Yes, most <laughs> cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. it, you know, it's maybe a, roughly a, a third female, a third male, and, and a third, we don't know. 50, right. you know 10, 15 exactly. percent, yeah, we don't know. But, yeah, but okay. Uh, and then, so we're going to pivot to our last question. Again, I just want to thank you before we move on to this last question. Uh, we, you know, we've been here with Facebook Live and WebMD. Uh, Tracy Johnson is an OBGYN, and I'm a pediatrician, and we're, we've been so great, you know, happy to answer your questions and get some information out there. So Anne asks, and you know, I might take a stab at this for mommy brain sure, too, sure. but I had to smile when I saw this question. She says, is pregnancy brain real? 
how long does it last? I had my child over a year ago and still can't find words sometimes. So I'll let you answer and then I'm going to sure. put in my two cents. I think pregnancy brain is very real. I mean, there's a whole host of different hormones in different levels while you're pregnant. And I think that kind of, you know, the pregnancy fog, I, I think is, is genuine. Um, as far as postpartum, you have the changes in hormones. I think immediately after it definitely is. Um, and I'd like to get your opinion about the year and after. And then it turns into mommy brain, right? <laughs> mommy brain. <laughs> and we're both moms, so we can say it. I yes, have mommy brain definitely. for sure. Um, so, you know, I think that, yeah, I, I think that it, mommy brain's real for sure after you deliver. Uh, you've got the hormones fluctuating, but then also, as I um, you know, alluded to before, it's a lot. Your life absolutely changes. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, it's not just about you. It's about your baby and all the development they're going through and their nutrition and you know, planning for them. And they, you know, they go through developmental phases so quickly. I just remember as a mom even looking at it, not just as a pediatrician, but you know, they were just like six months later, they're a completely different child. Like every few months, they change. So you're constantly you know, trying to plan for that. So, it's a different type of life that you live after you have <laughs> that's a baby. Right, that's and right. so, you know, if you forget, you know, that one appointment or that one thing to do, be kind to yourself. <laughs> be kind to yourself during your pregnancy, after the delivery, and even as a mom, I think we, we try to do too much sometimes, and I think it's just really important to, to take care of ourselves as well. Well, that was our last question, and, you know, thank you for all your questions. Uh, Tra Dr. Tracy Johnson and myself, uh, Dr. Hansa Bhargava, we're very, we've been really happy to be here and answer your questions, and hopefully you learned something. And, again, there's some great sites that you can go to, obviously WebMD, but, uh, you know, some of the, the sites that uh, Dr. Johnson named as well in terms of the EPA and uh, the Choose My Plate, and, of course, our pregnancy app is great for information mm -hmm. as well, as is the baby app. So hopefully you can go there and... Thank you very much for joining us. We've uh, we've really had a nice time talking. Thanks guys. Have a good one.